Um, Lord willing, we're going to do two chapters tonight in our trek through the Old Testament, book by book and chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So uh, 2 Chronicles 13 and 14, you can turn there if you're not there already. And while you're doing that, I just want to uh, quickly mention a couple things about New Year's Eve on Saturday night. Uh, just by way of a reminder, we're not going to have a New Year's Day service on Sunday morning, but at 7 p.m. local time, we're going to have a Bible prophecy update. It'll be a question and answer time. I spent most of the day today going through literally hundreds of questions from all over the world and uh, tried to sort of condense them and work on them. And uh, I w I've been asked uh, by a couple of online people if we're going to be doing any Facebook Live, and the answer is no. And the reason is, is because of the time difference. Uh, we are, however, going to uh, have it uploaded to YouTube as soon as we possibly can. And uh, I am going to, and I hope you will understand, I cannot answer all the questions. Uh, if I did, we would be well into next year before we were done, quite literally. So I am going to uh, do the ones that uh, I can and the time that we're going to have. How much time that is, I don't know, uh, but we're not going to rush through it. Uh, also, before we even get to the questions, I'm going to take a little bit of time at the beginning to address the stunning developments that I'm sure you've heard about concerning this UN resolution, which basically, if you can imagine this, makes it illegal for Jews to pray at the Western Wall. Think about that. It basically uh, makes it criminal now for Jews to lay any legitimate claim to their eternal capital of Jerusalem and uh, even parts of uh, Israel, specifically the West Bank, and um, this is pretty serious. And what makes it even more serious is that five days before the inauguration on January the 15th, uh, there is going to be a meeting in Paris, and 70 nations will be in attendance. And it is believed that they will force a two-state solution they will unilaterally impose a Palestinian state, and that this was sort of the, uh, the catalyst for that. It was the setting of the stage for that. As I was watching this unfold, I was telling my wife that <laughs> I, I was in disbelief. I was just stunned. Uh, I have been studying Bible prophecy and teaching Bible prophecy for almost 30 years now. And I remember talking about this many years ago, and it was sort of surreal that I'm watching it actually happen in real time as I'm watching the events unfold. Now what's really interesting is uh, Netanyahu, in response to the UN uh, solution, which, by the way, came by way of the United States in an unprecedented move, abstaining from the vote, when in the past the United States has always vetoed this kind of a, a vote. And if that weren't bad enough, Netanyahu, in response, said that they have, quote, ironclad proof that Obama orchestrated it. Obama's fingerprints are all over it. Now, I cannot even begin to uh, articulate the, the seriousness of this. And um, he's here <laughs> in Kailua. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I've been praying, God, please, um, no earthquakes, tsunamis, you know, bombs, just please, and at least until he goes back to the mainland. <laughs> but now here's, here's the thing. Um, 
I think it was yesterday, right? Wednesday morning, uh, we awoke to Secretary of State John Kerry for one hour and 13 minutes blaming and condemning Israel. I, I watched it, better said, I endured it as he just, I couldn't believe my ears what he was saying. I, I have to say that, uh, well, how do I say this without, I don't know, I'll just say it. <laughs> He lied. And these lies coming forth from his lips come from none other than the father of lies, the devil himself. The audacity to blame Israel and to condemn Israel as if it is Israel that stands in the way vis-a-vis -vis their settlements to peace. Israel has given land to the so-called Palestinians, and what do they get in return? Peace? No! They get missiles, thousands of them, on their heads. This is, um, well, I'll save it for New Year's Eve. <laughs> this is unbelievable. I, I cannot, for lack of a better word, this is unbelievable. A couple of weeks ago in the Prophecy Update, I mentioned that the amount of time before the inauguration is a lot of time, especially when it comes to the Middle East. And as such, anything can happen. Now, I kind of heard rumblings about something like this happening. There was some talk of and some suspicions concerning what Obama would do. And again, it, it happened. Just today, because I've been watching Russia very closely, as I know many of you have as well. And just today, Obama basically gave 35, I think it is, Russian diplomats something like 24 hours to get out of America. This was in, in, in concert with the uh, increasing of sanctions, and it was all done under the banner of the alleged uh, interference uh, in our U.S. elections on the part of Russia. Now, bear with me, but if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me correctly, and I'm pretty sure it does. Didn't Obama send his people to Israel to interfere with Netanyahu's re-election? Didn't Obama spend who knows how much money to try to get Netanyahu defeated? When I was uh, being interviewed by Jan Markell on her uh, radio program, I made the comment, and, and it kind of took her back a little bit, and she told me this afterwards. I made the comment that Obama has a satanic hatred for Israel. And Jan said, I've never really quite heard it, you know, said like that. <laughs> but I, I just, I have to say that over the last eight years, I have watched this man, and there's been a discernment in my spirit, and, and really a check in my heart uh, concerning uh, this man's hatred for Israel. And so I can't say that in, in some ways I'm surprised by this. It, it doesn't in, in a way surprise me. I think what, if anything, surprises me, if there is any surprise in this, is that he waited until now to do it. Now, why do I bring Russia into the equation? And we'll talk about this more on New Year's Eve. And that's, <laughs> anything can happen between now and New Year's Eve, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering tomorrow when we wake up and, you know, turn on our news feed and, and turn on the news, what, <laughs> what is going to happen? But um, some believe, 
and there could be some merit to this, that he is wanting to start a war with Russia before and even so that Trump does not take office. That's a pretty terrifying thought. We were just talking before the Bible study tonight about, and we will get to our Bible study tonight, but we were talking about how that, and there was just even this uh, interview where Obama said that he could have won a third term and beat Trump, which is interesting. But here's what's uh, even more interesting. He cannot do anything, one thing, a thing without God allowing it. And here's the thing, God will never allow him or anyone like him to do anything unless it ultimately serves his purpose and fulfills his plan. I think it was Warren Wiersbe who said that the devil is God's devil. He is a created being. He is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing. He is not all-present. He is the, the God's devil, and the devil cannot do anything. Ask Job about this. By the way, we might have a chance when we get to heaven to ask Job about, dude, what was that like, man? We can even ask Peter about it, because when Jesus said to Peter, uh, Peter, Satan has asked for permission to sift you as wheat. And uh, Jesus gave him permission, but ultimately it served his purpose because in the end, Peter came back. And it ultimately was allowed by God himself because it would fulfill his plan and his purpose. So never imagine that the devil is allowed to do anything in our lives unless God gives him permission. And he cannot touch even a hair on our head. And uh, we, we say it, it's become sort of canned and hollow, but we're quick to say God is in control. But if you really think about what that really means, God is in control. He directs the hearts of any man and every man, especially men like this, because they ultimately serve his purpose in the end. And by the way, uh, I, I really appreciated what uh, Trump tweeted. Uh, I think that Trump should tweet as much as he wants. <laughs> I know that some would disagree, but he tweeted something to the effect of, uh, Israel, hang in there, just wait till January 20th. <laughs> I'm on your side. We're, we've got this. And uh, very, you know, uh, pro-Israel. I appreciated that. But um, I, I got to say, I... Anything can happen between now and then, and I think it would behoove us to uh, really pray and, um, you know, just ask God. But in, in the end, no weapon forged against Israel will prosper. One of the things we're going to talk about on New Year's Eve is that in Ezekiel 38, even in Zechariah 12, God is the one, my wife and I were talking about this today, that it, it's God himself that brings these nations against his people, Israel. It's God who puts the hook in the mouth of those in Ezekiel 38, Gog. It, it's God in Zechariah 12 who brings, who makes Jerusalem a cup of trembling, a burdensome boundary stone. God himself does it. He's the one that brings it about. And so God is bringing it about, and it says, so that they will know, the nations will know that I am God. In other words, God is going to deal them a supernatural and decimating defeat, so much so that they will know that He is God. And here's the thing, so will Israel. In the end, Israel against all odds, insurmountable, impossible odds, which we're going to see tonight, by the way, where God just intervenes on behalf of his people and supernaturally gives them the victory over their enemies as numerous as they are. And then it's then when Israel will realize they will look upon him, Zechariah says, 12, whom they have pierced. 
they're going to realize this is the Lord. He, he is the Lord our God. And all the nations will know that He is God. I can't wait. <laughs> can't wait. Probably won't have to wait very long. So let's pray and we'll uh, get into our Bible study. Unless you just want to close in prayer after all that. <laughs> let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you that Israel is the apple of your eye and that no weapon forged against your people will prosper or prevail. Lord, thank you that you are in control and you control everything that is happening and you are allowing everything to happen because it ultimately fulfills your purpose and your plan. So, Lord, so be it. Lord, tonight in our time together in your word, would you minister to us, bless us, bless our Bible study tonight, Lord. We're asking you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 13. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Abijah became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. Abijah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. That's a lot of men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, twice as many, mighty men of valor. So the chapter begins with what's going to end up being a brutal and bloody civil war, really. And it's between the kingdom of Judah in the south and the northern kingdom. Now it's important to understand that what we're about to see is as detailed and even graphic as it is, shouldn't be seen as God endorsing this war and all the bloodshed that will come as a result of this war. Rather, instead of God endorsing it, God is inspiring it as a record of this war. And I suppose the question becomes one of why. Why do we have chapters like this in our Bibles, where we have the details, and as we're about to see, the bloodbath that will ensue? Why do we have a record such as this in our Bibles? I would suggest that the answer is found in the New Testament, in Paul's second epistle, to Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 he writes all scripture all scripture is given by inspiration of God and here's why it is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work we actually talked about this last week in the sense that we learn more from mistakes and failures than we do from successes. And one of the things that I uh, really see in my time in God's Word is that we have all of this graphic detail recorded for us so that we'll learn from the mistakes of men like this. <laughs> We're going to learn from mistakes and sins and failures and shortcomings of the likes of David. <laughs> Which is why, again, we have such graphic detail about what David did. It's not there because God wants us to know how bad David was. It's there because he wants us to know how good he is in spite of how bad <laughs> David was, and David was bad. Well, wait a minute, wasn't David a man after God's own heart? Yes. Wasn't David the sweet psalmist of Israel? Yes. But he was also a murderer and adulterer. Two crimes under the law at that time that were punishable by death. But God, <laughs> but God was merciful to David. God built a house for David in that the Savior of the world would come from the lineage of David, the house of David. 
Well, verse 4, Then Abijam stood on Mount Zemariam, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, Jeroboam and all Israel. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt? Yet, verse 6, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. Then worthless rogues gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. When Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and could not withstand them, and now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the sons of David. And you are a great multitude, and with you are the gold calves, which Jeroboam made for you as gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, verse 9, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands, so that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not gods? But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites attend to their duties. And verse 11, they burn to the Lord every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. They also set the showbread in order on the pure gold table and the lampstand of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. For we keep the command of the Lord our God, but you <laughs> have forsaken him. Now look. God himself is with us as our head and his priests with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O oh, children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. Wow, what a speech. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> the problem is, is that it's not totally true. <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting record of his appeal, this appeal on the part of Abijah to Jeroboam. And at first read, it almost sounds like it's true and accurate, but upon closer examination, what you find is that it is not. <laughs> and the reason it is not is because of what is known as revisionist history. That's where you rewrite history. Nothing has changed, right? <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. It's, it's quite interesting to me. It's grievous, but it is interesting how that the world has rewritten Israel's history. I saw a post on Facebook today about um, the history of the Palestinians. I mean, where's their language? Has there been any archaeological finds with any coinage or artifacts or anything that would be Palestinian? Why is there no findings or archaeological digs that uncover anything that would prove that there ever was really a Palestinian people? Answer? You ready for this? Wait for it. <laughs> there is none. Because there was no such thing as a Palestinian. It was named Palestine in the year 135 AD when the Romans captured Israel and destroyed Israel and the Jews were spread out throughout the four corners of the earth and as was the custom in that time they would name the land that they just conquered after the enemy of the people they just conquered. Who's the enemy of the Israelites? The Philistines. It was named Philistia. A transliteration of Philistia is Palestine. That's where the name came from. First it was named Ilias Capitolina. That didn't stick. <laughs> they ended up changing it to Philistia. Palestine. And it remained Palestine for almost 2,000 years until May of 1948, when by one vote in the UN, prophecy of prophecies 
was fulfilled. Can a nation be born in a day? And it was. The rebirth of the nation of Israel. And to me, the whole clock on Bible history and Bible prophecy began to start ticking from that day on. I would venture to say it sped up in June of 1967 after the Six Day War, the miraculous Six Day War, where against all some of the, sorry, I want to recommend a great documentary called Against All Odds. It chronicles and documents the miracles of the Six Day War. Here's one example. I know I've shared it before. It is so fascinating. Only God could do this, right? So the Israelite army, the Israeli army, was needing to cross this uh, minefield, but they couldn't see where the mines were. And it was at night. And so God brings out of nowhere this powerful wind, and it blows all the sand off the landmines and they could see every single one of those landmines and they made safe passage across that land to their safety. That's just one of many that God did. And God in that six day war allowed the Jews, again fulfilling prophecy, to recapture Jerusalem, their eternal home. And now what do we have today? We have a rewriting of that history. (laughs) We have a rewriting of that history. And so now today, according to the United Nations Security Council, the Temple Mount, you know, for those of you that went to Israel with us, you know, the, the, the Muslims control the Temple Mount. And that's prophecy too, that the Gentiles will have the outer courts, that they will control the Temple Mount. To this day, Moshe Dayan, inexplicably, gave, after they captured Jerusalem, gave the Temple Mount to the Arabs my people, (laughs) in a gesture of, I guess, goodwill, as some suggest. And that was a fulfillment of prophecy. It's in Revelation. And so when we go to Israel, there are times that this last time, in fact, in 2015, last year, we could not get up on the Temple Mount. In 2010, we could. But we couldn't take our Bibles there. Now, think about this. Today, if we were to go to Israel today, subsequent to this UN Security Council resolution, we may not even be able to go to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. And, and oh, by the way, the, the, the old city, <laughs> the, the Christian quarter, forget it. It's illegal now, according to this. The Jewish quarter, illegal now, according to this. The holy sites of Judaism and Christianity are now illegal for Jews and Christians to go to based on this UN Security Council resolution. I I can't even begin to tell you how unthinkable this is. This is, but God allowed it and I know God has a plan. It's going to fulfill His plan. Lord come quickly. This is crazy. This is just crazy. So this is revisionist history, and this is what Abijam is doing. He's rewriting the history of Israel in order to shed himself in a more favorable light. At best, this is a half-truth. And you know what a half-truth is, right? A half-truth is a whole lie, okay? So it's a half-truth such that the rebellion was due in large part to what Rehoboam did on his part. G. Campbell Morgan describes Abijah's half-truth this way. He says, It is a strange mixture of misinterpretation and religion. The misinterpretation is in his statement of the reason for the rebellion of Israel, which culminated in the crowning of Jeroboam. He attributed the rebellion to the influence of evil men whom he described as sons of Belial. Isn't it true that we always seek to shed ourselves in a more favorable light. And we'll rewrite history in order to do it. And (laughs) our sin always looks worse on somebody else than it does on us, right? Can we talk? (laughs) Your sin of pride, my, my sin of pride, looks so much more sinful on you than it does on me. And that's the whole speck beam thing, isn't it? When Jesus said, hey, 
first remove the beam, the telephone pole, out of your eye so you can see clearly to get that speck out of your brother's eye. And oh, by the way, uh, in the original language, it uh, indicates that that speck actually came from that log. It's, it's the same, it's a splinter from the very log that's in your eye, that little speck, that little sp splinter. You've heard the expression, it takes one to know one. How do I know that you're full of pride? Because I'm a professional when it comes to pride. I know what pride smells like, I know what pride looks like, and I wear it. And I surely smell like it, and so I can certainly recognize it in your life. Verse 13, But Jeroboam caused an ambush to go around behind them. So they were in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind them. And when Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear, and they cried out to the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. Then the men, verse 15, of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. Then Abijah and his people struck them with a great slaughter. So, try to wrap your mind around this. 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. That's half a million men. That's a lot of bodies on the battlefield. That's a lot of men. That's a lot of lives. That is a great slaughter. Thus, verse 18, the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed. And here's why, and I want you to hang on to this. I want to come back to this. They prevailed because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. Wow. Verse 19, And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, Jeshanah with its villages, and Ephraim with its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. But Abijah grew mighty, <laughs> married 14 wives, okay, that's a lot, and begot 22 sons and 16 daughters. Now the rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways, and his sayings are written in the annals of the prophet Idu. And we don't have the prophet Idu, we don't have the book of Idu, because it is not considered to be necessary and inspired and included in the canon of Scripture. If it were necessary, God would have certainly preserved that book for us. So chapter 13 ends with what I believe is a very powerful principle as it relates to the reason, perhaps better said the simple reason, that Abijah was victorious. And it's there in verse 18 where we're told that the reason they prevailed was because they simply relied on the Lord God of their fathers. This is one of those simple truths in God's Word that in some ways can be too simple. Yet, in other ways, it's easier said than done. This speaks to what I believe is one of the most powerful yet simple truths as it relates to relying on, fully relying on, and depending on the Lord. The ironic thing is, as we get to the end of chapter 14, when we're introduced to Asa, King Asa, who was one of only nine good kings, of whom it is said they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, this King Asa re relied on the Lord his God. And as we're going to see, God delivered into his hands, against all odds, a million-man army of the Ethiopians. And then you would think, and it's a famous passage in Second Chronicles chapter 16, which Lord willing we'll get to next week. Verse 9 to be exact, and you know it well. When the seer comes to King Asa and says to him, Don't you know that the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth, 
looking for hearts fully devoted to Him, relying on Him so that He could be strong on their behalf. Now why in the world would you say that to King Asa after he had just relied upon the Lord, fully devoted to the Lord when he was up against that million man army? Because the next time he didn't rely on the Lord. He trusted in his own strength his own savvy, his own strategies. Never think for a second that when there's that still small voice of the Holy Spirit warning you concerning something, that it's for good reason. Even when you think, I, I would never do that. I think of Peter <laughs> as overconfident in himself as he was. His, his self-confidence, his, his courage. And Jesus has to warn him and say to him, Peter, <laughs> you're going to deny me three times when the rooster crows. You're gonna and what is Peter? I'll never do that. King Asa, I will never do that. I will always rely on you, no matter what. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Chapter 14, verse 1. So Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa his son reigned in his place. In his days the land was quiet for ten years. I like that. I like ten years of peace and quiet and calm. <laughs> Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And here's why. For he removed, verse 3, the altars of the foreign gods in the high places, and broke down the sacred pillars, and cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was quiet under him. And he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. So here chapter 14 begins with the record of what we know from Scripture was only, uh, was one of only nine good kings of which Asa is one. We're told that he did what was right in the Lord's sight and we're even told why. He removed all the altars, all the high places to the foreign gods and Actually, we were first introduced to this good king back in our study through 1 Kings chapter 15. And if you don't mind, I want to just read verses 9 through 13 real quick because it provides us some very uh, interesting detail that I'd like to talk about for just a moment. It says, In the twentieth year of Jeroboam king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah, and he reigned forty-one years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacha the granddaughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. And he banished, listen, the perverted persons from the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Also he removed Maacha, his grandmother, listen, get this, from being queen mother, because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. Remember who Asherah is, was? The sex goddess, the goddess of sex and fertility. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. <laughs> wow. This is one of those places in God's Word where you can almost read past something that has valuable personal application. And what I'm referring to is where we're told that he banished the perverts and removed and burned the high places that his grandmother had made. In other words, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord by taking a stand for righteousness against his own family. That is hard, especially in that culture, in that day, it was unthinkable, much like it is modern day. When it comes to a parent, a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, this is forbidden. This is unthinkable. Well, 
There's another reason I wanted to uh, go back to 1 Kings, and it's because I need to point out something that has to do with this false teaching of generational curses. I, I wish that I didn't have to keep talking about this and um, pointing this out, but this is a, a, a doctrine, a false doctrine, that is still gaining traction. This notion that the children pay for the sins of the father. That there's a generational curse, the curse of the, and from the sins of the father. Again, we've addressed it before, but I think it would be good to uh, address it again. Much of the confusion stems from this notion that children pay for the sins of the father. And we first did a study of this when we were uh, studying the Ten Commandments back in Exodus chapter 20. And I want to read verses 4 through 6. This is the commandment, the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, listen, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But, and this, by the way, is where the doctrine of generational curses is birthed. But, verse 6, listen very carefully, showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You'll actually find this mention of how God visits the sins of the fathers a total of three more times in the first five books of Moses. Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Well, that's a great description of the nature of God, isn't it? Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Numbers chapter 14 verses 18 and 19. The Lord is, here it is again, <laughs> long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, those who are truly guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. And listen to verse 19, this is key. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And then lastly, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. By the way, Deuteronomy means second law. Do, deuce, Ronomy, second law. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, here it is, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those
and slow to anger. He doesn't visit the iniquity for the purpose of punishing for the sins of the Father. Number two, the Lord is so compassionate that he visits the children unto the fourth generation. Why? Because the effects of the sins of the Father can go that far to the fourth generation. There have been studies done of the descendants of criminals, and it is really quite shocking to see that the third and fourth generation are also criminals. And conversely, those same studies where you had ministers and evangelists and, you know, people that were upstanding citizens and really good people, basically. And even the fourth generation, they were taking that on. That was a legacy that had been passed on. And that's why he visits the iniquities of the children unto the third and fourth generation. It's because the effects can pass on to that generation. And again, he does it to show mercy and forgiveness. And that's what we see thirdly. He visits the iniquity of generations of children whose fathers hated God for the purpose of showing mercy to thousands of those who love God. Number four, and think about this. One can't be held responsible for or make payment for the sins of another. Think about that. I like how one said it. Every tub has to stand on its own feet. Of course, this was an old-fashioned tub, you know, that had the, the legs. We cannot, I cannot pay for your sins. For, first of all, Jesus already paid in full for all our sins. I'm not going to be held responsible for your sins. I'm only held responsible for my own sins. Number five, and this is key too, even if there was a generational curse, the cross broke it, right? There is therefore, Romans 8, 1, now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. When, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished, period. There's no comma, there's no colon, there's no semicolon, there's no however, there's no anything. It's just, it is finished, period. If there was a curse, it was broken. It is finished. Number six, and this is to me one of the most compelling reasons that generational curses are not biblical. We have no example of generational curses being dealt with anywhere in Scripture. And this should really be the litmus test by which we gauge and put to the test any doctrine when we, when we go to the scriptures and, and really in a threefold way as it relates to the New Testament. Did Jesus preach it in the Gospels? Did the early church practice it in Acts? And did Paul refer to it in the epistles? And that's really the, the three-pronged test, if you will, for any doctrine. And, oh, by the way, <laughs> I can say this now, but this is one of the reasons why we don't do foot washing. And aren't you glad, by the way? I know I am. I don't like feet. I don't even like my own feet. I like my wife's feet, but I don't like my feet. Could you imagine? I, the, the SDA church we rented for 11 years does foot washing. And by the way, I don't know if, if you remember me sharing this, but I grew up Seventh-day Adventist. I was baptized at age 13 in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I remember every foot washing Sunday, my parents would not go. <laughs> and I was really glad for that uh, because it was just awkward. And it's humbling, isn't it? To have somebody wash your feet. Now, why don't we 
as a church, and many with us, do foot washing because of that three-pronged test. It's not something that the early church practiced in the Acts. It's certainly not something that Paul referenced or preached on in the epistles. And, and so too is this true with generational curses. Jesus or Paul never one time mentioned generational curses. The book of Acts never shows any time where generational curses are dealt with. The Old Testament prophets never refer to it, nor do they prophesy about it. And as we see in our current study in the Old Testament, we see good kings coming from bad kings, and we see bad kings coming from good kings. And King Asa is a textbook case of that, where he comes from a father who did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and his son does that which is right in the sight of the Lord. And how many more times do we see just the opposite, where a father did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and his son does that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. Good kings come from bad, and bad kings come from good. Good sons come from bad fathers, and bad sons come from good fathers. And that's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. So <laughs> let's move on. Verse 7, Therefore he said to Judah, Let us build these cities, and make walls around them, and towers, gates, and bars, while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought Him, and He has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah, who carried shields and spears, and from Benjamin 280,000 men, who carried shields and drew bows. All these were mighty men of valor. Now, what he does here is interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that he really takes advantage of this season of peace and quiet. In other words, he doesn't waste this time. He doesn't waste this season of peace, but instead he sees it as an opportunity to prepare for what's next. And this is just wisdom. Here's the thing. Oftentimes in our lives, we fritter away those seasons in our lives where and when we're not in a trial, only to be blindsided and ill-prepared when adversity strikes. Here's an illustration. I think about it when it comes to storms, by way of an example. We have to prepare for the storm before the storm. Because when the storm hits, it's too late. You need to shore up and strengthen during the time of calm. So that when, not if, that storm hits, because when it hits, you can't go out and start boarding up windows. It's too late. It's too late. Well, how does that apply to those seasons in our lives when we're not in a trial? Well, that's the time to be in the Word of God. To be shoring up your spiritual life by the Word of God. Because when, not if, that adversity strikes, it's too late to go back. It already has to be there. It already has to be boarded up, shored up, if you prefer. I can't tell you how many times I've sat across the pastoral desk of counseling. Not here, of course. This is on the mainland, always the mainland. And I've had people that are going through the trials of their lives asking me for Scripture because they, they just don't know what to do. And it's really hard. It puts me in a, 
in a very unenviable position because, I mean, I can, I can give you the scriptures, but listen, they should have already been there. They, they should already have been written on the tablets of, of your heart. They should have already been committed to memorization. They should already be there for you so that when, not if, that storm hits, it doesn't come crashing down. I think of the parable that Jesus taught about building your house on the sand and building your house on the rock. When the storm comes, if you've built your house on the shifting sand, it's going to come crashing down. But if your house is built on the rock, it's immovable. It's immovable. I think of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 where he talks about how nothing moves him. Nothing moves him. He is immovable. Why? Because he's on the rock. Many years ago, my wife and I lived on the mainland. We used to, this is BC, before children. <laughs> we would go to uh, Cannon Beach, Oregon, and we would stay there. They had a Christian conference center there. And uh, th th we would uh, just lo look at and just sort of be in awe of what, what is called Haystack Rock. And it's just, depending on the tide, you know, it's, it's in, in the water, sort of, you know, off, offshore. And it's just this majestic, big rock right out there in the, on, the, on the beach, in the ocean. And the waves are crashing up against Haystack Rock. And yet, if you look closely, you can see these birds singing as if to their creator in praise, oblivious to the crashing waves beneath them. Why? Because they're on the rock. They're on the rock. And that is the rock that is Jesus Christ, who is the Word. When we are firmly planted on the rock, nothing moves us. And certainly, if our lives are built on that foundation, they will not come crashing down. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. To the churches in the area of Galatia, chapter 6, Galatians, verse 10, he says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. In other words, seize every opportunity that God gives you. Make the best of every opportunity, especially those seasons of peace. Verse 9, then Zira, the Ethiopian, here it is, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. And he came to Marisha. So Asa went out against him. And they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Zavatha at Marisha. And Asa, verse 11, cried out to the Lord his God and said, and I love this prayer, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail, listen, against you. Notice he doesn't say <laughs> against us. No, no. <laughs> Lord, this is, this is between you and them. 
Don't let them prevail against you. By the way, this is what David did when he was up against a million man army of the Ethiopians, as it were, in the form of Goliath. It, it, it's almost humorous when you really read the text and the account. Here, here's Goliath thinking, is this a joke? You send a little kid out here? This is no joke. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically take you and feed you to the birds of the air. And I, and I love David's response. I mean, it is classic. It is so good. Keep in mind, he's a teenager at this time, okay? And he, he says to Goliath, this is a very loose paraphrase, you'll, you'll forgive me. Basically this, oh, <laughs> Goliath, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. There, there is a huge misunderstanding here. You think this is between you and me? <laughs> oh no, it's not me that you're up against. It's God. It, it's the God that you have blasphemed, you uncircumcised Philistine. And that, it's really interesting and it's notable. He never once calls him by his name Goliath. You know why? Goliath means champion. And to David, he's no champion. He's the uncircumcised Philistine that has blasphemed the name of my God. And by the way, he heard it one time. And King Saul, to his shame, and even David's brothers, and the army of Israel had listened to that uncircumcised Philistine blaspheme their God for 40 days and 40 nights, all day, every day, all night, every night. David hears it one time. It's not okay. It's not okay. This is unacceptable. Do not let him prevail against you, O oh God. And here's Asa to his credit. Do not let man prevail against you. This is against you. Now, <laughs> I might be giving Asa too much credit here because if you really think about it, what choice does he have right about now? You might say that he kind of has to trust God. He kind of has to rely upon God. I mean, after all, he's up against a million man army. And he's got few in comparison. He is so outnumbered. Unless God does this for him and instead of him, they're done. And he knows it. So of course he's going to rely on God. He, he can't rely on his own strength. He can't rely on his own numbers. So of course he's going to cry out. And it's not just that he cries out, it's how he cries out, and that he acknowledges that there is nothing too hard for the Lord to do. I love this, I love this, I love this. I found myself this last week praying this almost verbatim concerning a situation. Lord, this is nothing for you. You could do it blindfolded with your hands tied behind your back. I hope that's not blasphemous, but you, you could do this effortlessly. You could do it with the stroke of a pen, so to speak. You could just, with, with just the command, you could just, nothing is too hard for you. You can do this, Lord. And that's what Asa does here. And we know what happens. The Lord hearkens unto the voice of his cry and delivers this million-man army of the Ethiopians into his hand. And it is a... Wow. <laughs> Was that me? <laughs> I, I ate before the Bible study. I'm so sorry. I, whoa. <laughs> Should have had some Tums. Okay. That was not me. That was not that. I just want you to know that was not that. I'm just 
Let's uh, bring this Bible study to a close. How's that? Verse 12, So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled, and Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away very much spoil. Then they defeated all the cities around Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they plundered all the cities, for there was exceedingly much spoil in them. They also attacked the livestock enclosures, and carried off sheep and camels in abundance, and returned to Jerusalem. Okay, this is what we talked about prior. You would think that on the heels of a miraculous victory such as this, that this Asa would never again for the rest of his life ever have a crisis of faith. I mean, you would think that, man, if God can do that, phew, all I have to do is just rely on the Lord and no matter what comes my way, He'll take care of it. Here's the thing. As we're going to see, Lord willing, in the next two chapters, next week, Asa will be on the receiving of this, the receiving end of this warning concerning this exact thing. Not only will he have a crisis of faith, he's actually going to forsake the Lord. And the reason he forsakes the Lord is because he doesn't have to rely on the Lord. Now he's got resources. Now he's got numbers. Now he's got strength. Now he's got this. Isn't it true that we only call upon the Lord and rely upon the Lord when we don't have options? We don't have the resources? Oh, don't our prayers just take on a powerful, you know, meaning when we're in need? Oh, Lord, please provide this. I don't have enough money for the rent for this bill. And conversely, when the money's in the bank, do we cry out to the Lord like that? No, we, we don't need to. So now the next time this happens, Asa is going to rely on his own strength and his own military strategy. And you know what's really interesting? is he actually pulls off the victory doing that. In other words, his reliance, his strategy, his, his plans, trusting in his own ability, he actually pulls it off. But to his own peril. All because he didn't rely on the Lord. And did we just not see that prior in the in chapter 13, they prevailed. Why? Because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. And, and here with Asa, he, to his own peril, fails. Why? Because he didn't rely upon the Lord. One last thing and we'll, we'll close. Very well-known proverb, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and He shall direct thy paths. Right? We have it memorized. We sing it. We love it. We have it up on our walls. But think about that. When do we lean on our own understanding? When we have understanding. And let's affirm grasp of the obvious, but bear with me. When do we acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways? When do we actually trust in the Lord with all of our heart? When we don't understand? Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand why you're allowing this. I don't understand why this is happening. To which I can just hear the Lord responding, well, it's about time. 
The only way that I can get you to trust in me with all of your heart and acknowledge me in all of your ways is when you don't understand. Because if you did understand, you wouldn't acknowledge me and you wouldn't trust in me. Now you have to trust in me and you have to acknowledge me because you don't understand. Now can I just do this? Can I make your path straight as one translation renders it? Can I straighten this out for you? I know you don't understand and by the way I made it so that you don't understand because you have to trust in me now and you have to acknowledge me in all of your ways. And it's almost like I'm hearing God say, watch me now. Watch me now. It's like when the Israelites are making the exodus out of Egypt and Moses is standing there at the Red Sea. I mean, talk about no options. You got the Egyptians right on your tail. And, and, and God brings a pillar of fire to keep them. And then you, you got the Red Sea in front of you, the Egyptians behind you. And Moses puts the rod out at God's command and parts the Red Sea so that the Israelites can walk on dry land. And I, and I love what Moses says, Behold the salvation of the Lord. In other words, see, the, that, talk about God directing your paths. <laughs> this is, I think, where God wants us to go. The Red Sea's parted, let's see, dry ground, the Egyptians are here, certain death, this is life, this is the way, walk ye in it. <laughs> you might say that's a pretty straight path that God has uh, led, led for me and, and, and created for me. And you, you trust in the Lord. And, acknowledge the Lord and He will part the Red Sea for you and make straight the way for you. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, once again your word is so alive, so active, so sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, thank you for your word and for everything that we've seen here tonight in your word. The many truths that we can take with us tonight and personally apply to our lives. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would enable us to do that. That we would not just be merely hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Lord, again, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.